Welcome to the Holistic Health Matters podcast, where it's all about maximizing your health potential in body, mind, and spirit so that you can pursue the abundant life more effectively. I'm your host, David Sandstrom, naturopathic doctor and biblical health coach, and this is episode number 16. This is part two of a two-part series on coping with stress. We're talking with Andy Ainsworth, who is a Christian counselor. He's been in practice for 35 years, and he's an expert in relational care principles, and he knows an awful lot about dealing with stress and overcoming trauma. In the last episode, we talked about how to recognize the symptoms of PTSD, and if you might be experiencing that. If you haven't listened to episode 15, I suggest you go back and listen to that episode now, because I think you'll get a lot more out of this episode if you do. At the time of this recording, our nation, and in fact the whole world, is in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're all under a great deal of stress right now. We could all use a little help in managing our stress levels. Because if stress is left unchecked, it can compromise our vitality on a physical level. Almost everything we do in the holistic health world to pursue health is related to stress reduction. We can reduce our physical stress with good sleep or a chiropractic adjustment. We can unburden our bodies by reducing our toxin exposure. In this episode, we're going to be talking about how we can lower our mental emotional burden, which, if not dealt with effectively, can, through the mind-body connection, ultimately compromise our physical vitality. We don't have to be a war veteran to experience PTSD. The level of stress many people are experiencing right now with schools being closed, job layoffs, small businesses struggling to survive, the social isolation we've been experiencing. And when you consider the relentlessness of all this, add it all up, and for many of us, this meets or exceeds the level of mental-emotional stress a soldier could experience on the battlefield. This stress can manifest itself very much like PTSD. We talked about in the last episode how to recognize those symptoms so again, if you haven't listened to episode 15, I suggest you do it now. One thing before we get started, I need to apologize in advance for the audio quality here. When we started recording, my primary recording software malfunctioned and we had to use the backup recording. So we sound a little bit like we're in an empty warehouse and there's a lot more background noise. So I apologize in advance. Putting all this together isn't easy. So I appreciate your understanding, your patience in that. So let's jump right in. Last week we were talking about what PTSD looks like and what the symptoms and how they, what symptoms are and how they manifest in our lives. And today we're going to be talking about how we, what we can do about that. And I wanted to start off with uh, just reading about a study that I found when I was researching for my book, The Christian's Guide to Holistic Health. Harvard Health News published a, a study in 2010 they had 309,000 people involved in the study. So it was a fairly large study. And what they concluded was that loneliness, loneliness is a risk factor to all kinds of diseases mm. and mm. all-cause mortality. Here's mm. what they said. Mm. Dozens of studies have shown that people who have social support from family, friends, and their community are happier, have fewer health problems, and live longer. Conversely, lonely people... People who lack strong relationships have an increased risk of all-cause mortality of 50%. That's roughly comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day and greater than the risk from obesity and physical activity. So we all know that smoking cigarettes and having a sedentary lifestyle and being obese are risk factors for disease. But how many people are aware that a lack of relational connectedness can actually be worse than all of those? That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about holistic mm. health. We're mm. going to address all aspects of mm. our health. Sure, we're going to address our physical component. We're mm. going to watch our diets and mm. exercise and get our sleep. And that's all good. And that's foundational. But we also have this other component, this mental, emotional, and spiritual component that needs to be addressed as well. Andy's an expert in that. And I can't wait to hear what you have to share yeah. today. Yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate that, David. I appreciate your heart. Appreciate the journey you're on and doing this work. Uh, it's really fun. This is fun get to be with my old friend 
I get to say that now. Yeah, it's you know, great. It's been some years now. Yeah, I know. And uh, it's pretty pretty wonderful yeah. what you're doing here. And I know there's a whole lot of people out there being blessed by it. So thanks for having me. And, and very honored, very humble that I didn't be, sit, be well, sitting here with you, brother. Thank you for being here, buddy. Appreciate oh, it. Man, Appreciate love, you. We love you and Michelle. Thank you. And um, want to want to give honor to where honor is due in what I'm going to share. Uh, this no, this is nothing new. Uh, thank you for saying expert. And, you know, I've been at it for a while and doing the work. It's humbling to hear that and kind of embarrassing a little bit because there's so many forerunners and so many guys and, and women who have worked so hard in the trauma world to in the grief world mm -hmm. to help people. And I've just gleaned so many, so much from so many. And, and, uh, I just, I just, uh, am so grateful to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and his spirit living in all of us who believe him and who he, he says he is that it just an opportunity to work with people who are, are in pain mm -hmm. and very humbling and uh, wonderful blessing to walk with his people who are hurting. If the, if I, if I, when it's all said and done and if somebody were to say he was an expert in A, B or C, I hope they would say foremost that he, he, he loved people and mm -hmm. it, it had that deep heart of compassion for people that it, yeah. I hope that I'm an expert in that. And, yeah. and even then it won't be, and I hope my language is understood there yeah. when I say that. Well, amen, bro. I, yeah, okay. I, I share your sentiment. Yeah, yeah. So, so I want to give credit and, and honor uh, Richard T Tedeschi and Lawrence Calhoun. In the 1990s, they started putting together, they became very concerned and started putting together some stuff around post-traumatic growth. It's kind of been climbing and, you know, making its way and getting traction through time. And it's more la language more uh, you hear more often now. And, and yet it's still, the, the, the press gets, post-traumatic stress gets press. Uh, acute uh, traumatic um, disorder or stress gets press. Um, but not as much as post-traumatic stress. It's just more, uh, I guess, more glamorous. The pain is more mm -hmm. glamorous somehow. Yeah. Um, I don't believe it, but, but it, it just does. And so we, we want to talk about the good things. How about words of life rather than words of death? Mm -hmm. I think there's some biblical principles in there. Yeah. Post-traumatic growth does not deny the pain, as I alluded to, alluded to last week um, in our last discussion. But post-traumatic growth is a, a word of life that brings hope and encouragement that we may not even feel or see yet. And I think Hebrews 11.1 1 is pretty clear about that. And faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen. So the work in bringing words of life and encouragement and asking some provocative questions that may evoke some some feelings and some thoughts of maybe some some light and some uh, some truth here to the dark times of trauma. And it's a little at a time. We know I mentioned last time one brick at a time. It's not fast. We're not going in. We're not trying to change things and lecture people into healing and think think right. You walk with somebody who's in trauma, it's a journey. We don't walk in and lecture them and advise them on how they should feel with biblical truth and come on, turn the light on, and now it's time to grow. Mm -hmm. um, that's just cruel. Right. And uh, um, Jesus is very clear about weeping. We were talking about earlier this morning about weeping with those who weep. Yeah. Um, and so there is that time so we can move into the celebration work. And it's simultaneous. It's not uh, a formula. It is a process of asking questions. What I have found in following our mentors and people I've read and, and studied and, and worked through the years in various uh, traumatic situations, that, that it's just asking wise, gentle questions and even silence in the beginning is crucial. Sometimes there's no question. So part of the growth process is just weeping with and maybe no language at all. Yeah. That will set up a foundation of care. And that is when a person is hurting and they're going through some strong emotions, they don't need a pep talk. They don't need answers. They don't need the solution, which is what we're all tempted to do. I like to put my Mr. Fix-It hat on and just, <laughs> hey, well, just, just get over it. That doesn't work. Yeah. What that person needs is to be heard and they want to be validated. So mm -hmm. the best thing to do is to listen. Sometimes it's just a hug. Sometimes it might be a tear shed together. Mm -hmm. But it's always with that person in mind. It's not, we don't want to take the focus off of them. We want to keep it on them and offer them the comfort and the empathy and the understanding that they need. And that will set the stage for learning the solution down the road. Amen. 
Yes. Many a times, Paulette, as and I, my wife Paulette and I work with couples together. I work with men. She works with men, uh, women individually. And many, many a time we have wept. And my understanding when it comes to clinical psychology and private practice, you know, you have to have boundary issues and, and maybe I'll not cry with your people you're trying to help. But I know a man who wrote it in red um, who said to weep with those who weep. <laughs> and uh, so when it comes to pain, it's a, it's a entering people's world, world and seeing and feeling their world for, by, through their lens and walking in their shoes with that healthy emotional responding that you're speaking of, David. Mm -hmm. I really do appreciate that. Just real quick, the, the Bible verse that Andy was just referencing is Romans 12, 15. Amen to that. Rejoice with those with rejoice, who rejoice yeah. and yeah. weep with those who weep. Yeah. It's a yeah. powerful, it's so succinct. But there's so much wisdom there. It's incredible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that, man. So there's good news here. Now, depending on where people are at, if I may carry sure. on, go on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, good news. This is all good news. Hard to believe this is all good news, but it is. Because we've talked about the hard news earlier. And when it comes to that, that uh, post-trauma, uh, it probably should be a little bit more definitive. You know, uh, acute stress disorder, as they call it in the DSM or stress, um, is a 30-day. Some would even stretch it out to 60 days of experiencing all those general symptoms I was talking about and perhaps even a few more, depending on age and experience and where you've been. And that's that's a, a, a usually a one-time event. It could be a car accident. It could it could be a death for the first time. It could be anything, but it's more, more a brief, kind of a, an episode, kind of a one-time, if not addressed, if not addressed, and it goes beyond, then there becomes a chronic sadness, which can evolve into depression and anxiety. Um, and that, that'll be kind of the mark. That'll be the cornerstone of post-traumatic stress disorder. It'll be the anxiety and the depression, along with the other symptoms I described. Some fade just because of time and work, some work being done, but delayed. Um, but the, the real cornerstone would be anxiety and depression will be, will be pretty, pretty, uh, will be magnified. Um, but we try, that's where we try to get it people in as soon as possible. There's a man, uh, who came to me, a good man, a uh, military, uh, veteran, uh, had been deployed back home, uh, for a while. He'd been working, but he'd been experiencing some trauma. He hadn't really talked to anybody. He was very prideful, uh, not untypical. Um, where, where he lived for a while in the mil serving in the military, and I'm, he's, he's my friend. I'm proud of him. I'm call, proud, and I'm humble to call him my friend um, as, as, a, as a war hero to me because he served us and protected us. And, but he showed up at the office uh, pretty shaken. And he'd, he'd uh, um, after all that time of kind of carrying the weight of his journey by himself, he went to Las Vegas a couple years back. And, uh, um, and when the shootings happened in Las, Las Vegas, he's just enjoying himself. He's talking to his wife on the phone, showing her the concert, you know, doing the whole concert thing. Uh -huh. And I don't know Las Vegas, but I, you know, this is my understanding. And he heard something very familiar and he mm. saw kids around him. We're talking about teenage kids dropping. Oh man. And dropping all around him. And my heart breaks even mm. bringing this up, but, uh. And he looked around, and, and he was hearing the bullets fly by his ears. Wow. He's got recording of it. He was listening wow. to it every day. Oh, man. So what we have here is somebody who's experiencing post-traumatic stress, experienced pain again, which compounded what he was experiencing, and then he's listening to it every day, and he's going and watching the news every day. So he's got the visual mm. going as well. Mm. So he went to a whole different place, and this is a serious warrior for us. Yeah. And, and he was shook and he, he moved into finally sharing his journey, not just Las Vegas. Um, of course I asked him to please erase your phone. He did on the spot in my office, wow. promised not to watch any more news, did some, didn't do some, Yeah. got him net on a network with other, which is typical for growth, you know, mention this a little bit in a little bit, but he got with other people who are walking through the same thing. So he's doing some stuff on online kind of like a Zoom, I think it was a go-to meeting at the time. Okay. And uh, sharing their journey and what they're experiencing, the healing they need, and being known, knowing uh -huh. others so they can share, care for one another. Yeah. The very thing you're talking about, entering each other's world without lecture, without fixing, just mm -hmm. doing the healthy emotional responding that you're talking about, David. Mm -hmm. And he stopped shaking. He came to my office one day and said, wow, what's going on with you, man? 
I'm pretty calm. <laughs> he had stopped shaking. Wow. Uh, that was one of his symptoms, which wow. we didn't mention in our symptoms earlier. Yeah. But he was chronically shaking. A good physiological response, right? Um, he's, he was uh, starting to remember things. He was able to concentrate. He wasn't irritated on the job. But this came as a it took, took some time. We know that. It, yeah. it, took, it took some time for him to find this healing. I want to make a point right there, Andy. And, and what you mentioned is that there is a connection between our mental-emotional component and mm. our physical component. Mm. So... There, our, our mental emotional part, our minds direct and send instructions to our brains and our brains run our bodies. So when the, when the instructions coming from our minds yeah, are good. traumatized yeah, and, yeah. and not right, the instructions that our brain receives is not right. Therefore, the instructions our brain gives to our bodies is not right. It's out of balance. So we need to address the whole person, not just oh, the man. physical, but the mental emotional as well. That's beautiful, man. Well, I love how you frame that. Uh, yeah, exactly. And that's what happened to him. And in the positive, the growth work happened the same way, right? I mean, it can happen either way. Absolutely. For good so, or bad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what this man did, and I'm going to move right on into some, some things that as you allow yourself to be known and know others, because it's about, you know, I mean, more blessed to give than to receive. When you walk into a group or make the call or get connected, um, you know, God's given to you. And you're receiving. And then he'll want you to eventually give, by the way. And that's going to be part of the growth process. Yeah. And, and that's what this man did. And that's what calmed his heart. God wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing. Yeah. And there's, there's. Well, wait a minute, I'm the victim here. Well, wait a minute. No, I'm, I survived that trauma. But God has called me to be something different. And this is what the world out here doesn't may not have. And they're counting on their own resources, mm -hmm. which they don't have. Right. So, so one of the things that this man embraced, and there's many others, uh, that's just one story. And he, he was heroic in another way. You know, I know he, he defended us, but he's also heroic in another way in how he addressed treatment. Now he can help other other guys hmm. and that he knows that haven't gotten help. Wow. And, and I, I don't know who they are. Yeah. yeah, I'll probably never meet them. But I'm really excited about the possibilities yeah. there. Yeah, excellent. So th what he what he experienced and others experienced is new opportunities. He moved into new opportunities for himself. He was considering, he'd already been considering a career shift and he was on his way to retirement, and he was already looking at this stuff, and and he started to embrace new realities for him that he can be he can be help some other men, he can help in out in the community, and people who've been hurt, that need care. That was never his frame of thinking, mm -hmm. and so his trauma, and that that he sought help and then sought more support in practical, caring weeping, heartfelt experiences um, that were supportive to his heart, that lifted his spirit, that he started embracing new options. And it wasn't me, it didn't, it wasn't an emotional shift, you know, I've gone through this trauma, so I'm going to change my career. So when I'm talking, I'm not talking about that. This was already moving in his heart. And he started, his eyes were open to how we can actually care for more people. So he embraced that will be part of the growth process. You may be on the job and you're in your career and you're doing your thing. You just simply may be caring for the guys on your job a little bit more. It's a new opportunity to embrace people. You'll see pain. You'll be more aware of people in pain around you. And you may find yourself embracing that opportunity just to care for somebody because mm -hmm. you know what, it, what's it like, what it's like to experience care yourself. So, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but and if, I, if I'm wrong, let me know. Does it help that person to get the focus off of themselves and onto other people? Is that part of the growth process? Is it embracing that mission or yeah. the purpose yeah. and it just helps distract them or how does that work? I think, you know, and that, that's a great question, by the way, and great statement. There are some will, will avoid their healing and just start serving other people to avoid their healing. So there, there could be an avoidance problem there and that'll be obvious. Yeah. Because they'll just be running around with the, like a chicken with their head cut off. Yeah. And it won't be helping anybody because it'll move into all those unhealthy responses of fixing and lecturing and uh, even criticizing and, and, and ultimately complaining, you know, giving their own story is more serious than that other person's story. Gotcha. Or withdrawing from. So all those unhealthy responses that we know about will, uh, will be the fruit of that. Yeah. But there is a time. And I'm not saying don't. I want to reiterate. 
going and taking care of your trauma and ter- sharing your story and maybe writing out your narrative and, and being able to shift your narrative th- simply through writing and through prayer and through support and being in group. And you'll know God will lead by wisdom and discernment. So Proverbs chapter 2, 1 through 11 speaks to cry out for wisdom and discernment and understanding and insight. So you'll know when to shift to authentically care. And that doesn't mean my journey didn't, my personal healing for trauma didn't, uh, healing didn't stop. Um, it, it continued while I started reaching out, which simply enhanced my healing. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't selfish motivated. I started seeing other people for their pain. And I think there's the, there's the line right there that, wow, I see your pain. It's not my pain. There's a differentiation. It's yeah. your pain. Yeah. That what I was talking about previously is that I see that other person. I'm just looking at my pain and I'm blind. Right. I'm actually blind to the other person. Yeah. I'm just living out mine. Well, so, you mentioned something a moment ago, Andy, and that is writing it down. One of the things I often encourage people is to try to notice your self-talk because we have, we all have thoughts that we're thinking inside our heads. We have a a narrator in there that's uh, interpreting the events of our lives. And sometimes that self-talk is not at all healthy and getting it down on paper can sometimes reveal some error to our thought. I love this quote by Michael Hyatt. He says, thoughts disentangle themselves over the lips and at the ends of pencil tips. Uh, Love that. And wow. sometimes when we write something out and we read it out loud, yeah. it'll actually sound quite silly. But when it's inside our head and those gears are turning inside, we don't recognize it for a lie, the lie that wow. it is. Wow. So when we're done here, man, I got a piece of speaking writing. I've got my journal in front of me, mm-hmm. people out there. And I'm going I'm to ask David to repeat that so I can write it down and go memorize it, how, yeah, the way he eloquently just spoke it. How could I not? Well, I'm, I'll give you the quote again right now. <laughs> Michael Hyatt. This is not me. It was Michael Hyatt. Thoughts disentangle themselves over the lips and at the ends of pencil tips. Wow. I don't think I'm the only one getting that. That is Isn't that good? That's really good, man. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that narrative can shift. Something can happen there. Another thing happens that I'm very excited for people because going back to isolation and withdrawal, people who have been traumatized will withdraw from their loved ones, their families, their wives, husbands, and they, they won't share. They don't want to burden. We don't want to burden our family. I don't want to burden my wife with my trauma. She yeah. doesn't want to burden me. Right. Which is, can be, become a very selfish thing to do uh, because our family wants to love us. Right. And and so it can become pride. We don't mean to. We're, we don't mean to go there. It's not mean spirited. It's just you know. So for some reason, I just can't or won't, or, or or there's some shame connected to it. Going back to guilt and in shame, possibly. Mm-hmm. And and so just gonna keep it to myself. I don't want to burden the world. Um, but what happens when I start moving through the growth work and my wife knows me, friends have known me and still do that the, the relationships are seem to be more embraced even more so. And we all desire, going back to what you were sharing earlier, brother, uh, we desire relationship. We hunger for it. Yeah. We thirst for it. For relationship, the alternative is aloneness or relational isolation, which is deadly yes. um, to our soul, to our lives. So stronger relationships come out of the post-traumatic growth work. It isn't just growth because you're sitting around. It's growth work that yeah. we need to do. And, and uh, so those, with my wife, my children, my, uh, uh, my brothers, my, uh, Brother David sitting right here, uh, community, there seems to be a larger embracing of that. So it's a, it's a, and then that, that becomes a self-perpetuating healing process because yeah. it's giving and receiving. It feeds on itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I'm um, also, uh, that, I, that I see along with that is that there's an inner strength gained. There's an awareness of an inner strength, and I, and I know where it's coming from. Just basic, basic fundamentals. There's that. There, there's uh, I have an inner strength to overcome. As I walk through and I start by the pen, writing stuff out, talking about it in all those different venues that are possible out there. Just gotta look. They're there. People yeah. are there. I have a strength because of Him who's living inside of me. Yes. And He actually says this. It's not my opinion. Greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. We thought you were going to quote Philippians 4.13. You know, yeah. I can do all things, things through Christ who gives me strength. Gives me strength. Uh, Romans uh, 8 and 11 says he lives inside of me. Yes. He says it two times in that context. Yeah. So, so the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and me. 
So we have a lot of uh, uh, um, spiritual authority. It's not arrogance. It's not pride. It's it's a truth that he gives us. It's not our opinion. It's yeah. not a feeling. It's he's walking with us. So we have an, an awareness because of who he is living inside of us and around us that, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm... I'm I'm, do I have a Caleb spirit in me, really? Yes, I do. I'm not 85 yet. Um, <laughs> but he said I, at 85, he went to Joshua and said, hey, brother, he didn't, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. I've got more fight in me than a 40-year-old. Yes. Let's go. Let's do yeah. the dance. I Let's, want my inheritance. I want my inheritance. Let's go. So there's got to, there'll be an overcoming spirit that will, if you will trust him with all your heart and not lean on your own pain, don't lean into your pain. Don't mm-hmm. lean on your own understanding. Mm-hmm. In all your all your ways, acknowledge Him. He will make your path straight. He will give you success. He will. Yeah. And and part of that will be a, an incredible strength to overcome the trauma that you've been gone through. Again, for a, a third, fourth time, we're not minimizing the trauma for a second. We're actually fully valuing it, because God is going to use that as Second Corinthians chapter one verses two and three and four speak to that the, the very comfort that I've received in my pain, I'm going to turn around and comfort that person there or there with the same comfort that I've experienced. Mm-hmm. It's it, there's a, there's going to be that awareness and that healing so I can give it. So I never want to forget my pain. I don't live in it, but I don't, I don't want to ever forget it because God has brought me around so I can love people. Again, on my tombstone someday, and I hope it's way out there, you know, I, I love Caleb's spirit. That's what I want. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the day, he loved people. That you know, And that comes from his power. And, and another thing that comes to mind and I have here before me is gratefulness. You'll experience gratefulness. You'll know you're in the growth process when you start being great, thankful to the Father, grateful towards others. You won't be so self-absorbed. So the growth process that we've been talking about, which requires that work, and, and getting with people, letting your story be known, you'll know that you're embracing opportunities and, and embracing different wow, different perceptions, different things going on. You, you're going to see it stronger relationships evolving because you're putting yourself out there. This is the growth work. Well, what's going to happen is you're going to start being grateful. And it's hard to believe if you're in darkness right now, and I'm speaking to somebody specifically, maybe several, that literally you're, you're, you're saying this can't be. Everything that we're sharing here today, it's not possible. My world is so dark. It's I'm Elijah taking a nap under a broom tree. Don't bother me. I'm out. I'm in a cave. I'm the only one. I'm not coming out. Ain't not, I'm paraphrasing. I know. Yeah. There will be a shift if you will make the call. Please make the call to your pastor, to your friend, to the counselor, to whoever you need to call and start moving just a little at a time, eventually you'll experience the light. You will see, you will hear, and you will feel his presence. And that's crucial to make that decision. It's not too late. You're not doomed. You're not, you're, uh, you're depressed, but, but you're not done by far. In fact, this very darkness that you're in that we fully validate sitting here in this little booth here, uh, we fully validate it. We have experienced it. We understand it. When you start moving, just a little movement, just a little movement, and you're gonna you're gonna experience Jesus's love. But it's gonna be your responsibility to get moving. Just one little inch, not yeah. not a big step. You don't have to take a big step. Just make yeah. the call. Um, and, and let me interrupt you. A moment ago, you were talking about how we can actually not forget about the pain. But we can remember that pain with grace. Yeah. And, and I think that yeah. really applies when it comes to forgiveness. You know, it's been said when we, when we forgive someone, we let the prisoner free and we find out the prisoner was me. That's right? good. So Very when good. we, when we truly forgive somebody from the heart, we're able to remember that painful event with less turmoil. Our stomach doesn't turn really like good. it used to. Really we can remember it with grace. We're not, we're not going to forget. We're human beings. We remember, but we can remember that event with grace. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about here is being able oh, to man. move on, not forget the past, acknowledge it, but move on into a more productive response. Yes. And one of the symptom, positive symptoms, if you will, is going to be the gratefulness. Mm-hmm. That's what forgiveness will do. Yeah. You know, you may, you may have lost your child to an accident. 
and it's been 10 years and I'm convinced there's somebody listening who, who, who's experiencing this 10 years since that time. And you still haven't forgiven that person, that drunk driver, or yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. So you've been drinking the poison expecting the other person to die. And any of you who have been in recovery, understand what I'm talking about. So, so that very thing that you're talking about, it'll move in. If you just get up and start crawling towards the phone, literally crawl, some will have to crawl to the phone, pick it up, make the call and allow yourself to just keep showing up one inch at a time. Mm-hmm. And, and it'll, the forgiveness piece is going to lead to that. Yeah. And, and even more so, mm-hmm. uh, your spiritual life is going to shift. That's what's going to happen if you, you continue to, to go toward, the, as my friend, my warrior friend that I spoke of a few minutes ago from mm-hmm. Las Vegas, mm-hmm. um, his spiritual life shifted. I uh, just had an experience with the father, his loving father, who was holding him the whole time. He never left him, never mm-hmm. will. He promises that. Um, we were talking about angelic hosts a while ago out of Psalm 91, 11, and uh, Hebrews uh, 1, 14. I don't know how he does it, folks. I just know... He's present, and, he, and he'll enable us to shift in our faith. Even though we're saying, where were you, God? How come you let this happen? Yeah. Why didn't you stop it? Whatever questions you have, if we, as we search Scripture and we trust him, we see that he's weeping with us in those questions and weeping for us. He's not rejecting or judging us. He understands your questions. He's yeah. not. He is such a secure, awesome God. He's okay with all that question keep keep asking those questions and he's just going to love you and and you'll find a spiritual shift as well ask friends who won't lecture you those same things where was god and your friend will just cry with you and understand Mm -hmm. you and be with you and and uh, just walk with you it's going to be okay Mm -hmm. and so that's going to be a journey and that your so you your spiritual life will shift a little at a time so we're we're speaking hope here going back to uh, hebrews 11 1 I know a lot of what I'm speaking to is is kind of really kind of way out there for a lot of people who are in their valley, right? Their deep valley. Hmm. Not trying to fix anybody out there, not trying to lecture you out of your pain. In fact, we're joining you in your pain this very moment and speaking words of life to give you hope one crawl at a time. Hmm. And it can happen. So we're not want to be really clear about this. So there's not a any any message on this this cast here that that would speak a a fix or some spiritual yeah. strange spiritual language i don't want to minimize anybody's pain because it could be people going through some a great deal of pain right now but one of the things that that Andy just brought up is the interconnectedness between the body the mind and the spirit they're all interconnected and they're interdependent which means what affects one for good or bad will by necessity alter the other so this guy that you're talking about the soldier hmm. he experienced a a healing on a mental emotional level and it led to spiritual growth sure did that's a wonderful thing yeah beautiful man beautiful thing so your capacity to reflect you'll see it shift you'll be able to reflect you'll move your brain will shift grow perspective about people in life you'll see just some brief ideas here almost sound too simple because of the complexity of post-traumatic stress and the pain that's just so entangled on so many levels the simplicity I'm talking about here sounds incredibly unreasonable. You know, mm. maybe some pill can take care of it mm. before any of this stuff. Yeah. And I'll just finish with this, brother, that the key is going to be making the call. Make the call and allow yourself to be known to the individual, to the friend, to the counselor, to the pastor, to the group, but to all of them. Multitude of counselors, there is success, and, and that includes trauma. So if somebody's listening and they don't have a network like that, are there, are there some organizations that you could recommend that someone could reach out to online? Or Yeah, you know, I don't know about the Atlanta area, but I know, if, uh, uh, for example, Grief Share is, a, is an organization. If you just push it, uh, type in Grief Share, it's okay. a good start. Okay. Um, your local church may have a Grief Share meeting, or there's, uh, I'm convinced there's a Grief Share meetings going on in the area yeah. here, in, in the Atlanta area. Mm-hmm. And in terms of specific trauma, there's uh, the American Association of Christian Counselors have have a whole program around trauma, uh, critical incidents, and trauma and crisis response. Okay. And they have counselors around the nation who have been trained in, in this area. Mm-hmm. You want to make sure if you are reaching out to them, make sure whoever you're calling, when you call, you just AACC.net. I think that's what it is. It's okay. been years. I don't know why I don't have that like memorized better. 
but uh, you let them know what your need is and you need a re- referral to somebody who's trauma and, and crisis response responsible, if you will, yeah. and, and capable. And they have a they have their list of people uh, that that you might be able to do a Zoom or a FaceTime if they're not in the area, and that works. That works for people. Uh-huh. And we know now it's not face to face, but it's working for people. Yeah, and uh, or in your immediate area. So those are a couple of ideas. Yeah, so you good. can actually normalize your experience with somebody who has one has been through it, two who's got the uh, kind of got the education, if you will, or the training. Yeah. Uh, experiential training as well as an understanding and getting so, into your world. What Andy is saying here, folks, is don't suffer alone. Get some help. If you think you're experiencing some of these symptoms of PTSD, don't suffer in silence. It's probably not going to get better on its own. Time mm-hmm. does not heal all wounds. Mm-hmm. You need to reach out and get some help, and there is hope, plenty of it, especially of through it. a biblical counselor. Amen to that. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, Andy, before you go, I want to ask you one final question. Remember the movie Back to the Future where the old Biff got a hold of the time machine and he went back in time and he talked to the young Biff and he gave him the sports almanac and that dramatically changed his life. If you could go back in time and talk to a younger Andy when you were first getting started in counseling, what would you tell him? Wow. Uh, Young Biff. (laughs) If you walk up and call me young Biff or old Biff sometime, (laughs) you know, that's pretty simple and I have a lot to be thankful for. But in my later years here, semi later years now, as I look at as old Biff, if I could just speak in that guy's ear, it would be to stop, son, stop and listen to me because I want to talk to you. To really sit with him and learn to listen Mm. to his voice that lives inside. If you call yourself a believer um, and young Andy was a believer at that time and he wanted to speak, he wants to speak to all of us by his spirit. If my confession publicly, and I'll say it out loud to anybody, my greatest sin wasn't ignoring God. It wasn't denying God. It wasn't in some deep sin somewhere and in a lifestyle. It was not being mindful of his voice mm. as an experience every day. I wasn't mindful of him. So I became mindless until Sunday or some serving project. Mm. thought I was in the scripture. I thought I was reading. I thought I was studying. I was, I was being mindless, mm. much less. Wow. And that that young Andy would say, yes, sir, and start practicing that. And that would mean, in his word, that would mean music, that would mean listening to mentors saying, hey, yeah, you, think about, you need to think about some things that might be going on in your life. So do a little less talking and a little more listening. Probably God gave us one mouth in two years. Yeah, and he's still working on me on that one because I can I get going on the, my <laughs> world, David, and I just get flapping and doesn't help anybody. All right, that's a good word, Andy. Thank you, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. Love you, brother. I love you too, David. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Andy Ainsworth. He's uh, just a wealth of knowledge. I'd like to summarize what we talked about. Firstly, you don't need to be a soldier to experience the symptoms of PTSD. When people are experiencing symptoms as a result of their stress, we're often tempted to suffer in silence. We mustn't fall for the lie that things will get better on their own. They probably won't. We need to get some help, and we've got to seek out someone who's skilled in leading people through stress and out of trauma. What skills should we be looking for in a counselor? Well, first and foremost, we need someone who has empathetic listening skills and Hopefully, they're skilled with emotional responding. When someone is suffering with acute stress and they reach out for help, they're not ready to jump to the solution. They need to be heard. What they've experienced and what they're feeling needs to be validated. They shouldn't be shamed. They probably already feel a level of shame, and there's no point in a friend or, worse yet, a counselor throwing salt on the wound and increasing their burden with more shame. Another thing a good counselor needs to understand is that our circumstances didn't take God by surprise. A good counselor should understand that God's Word has answers for all the things we go through in life. An able counselor should be able to point out some of the appropriate passages from Scripture that lead us down the road to overcoming the stressful event. We might want to seek out a good friend who has some of these skills, 
or we could look for a lay counselor at our church. Many churches have a ministry called Stephen Ministers, where lay people are trained in coming alongside somebody that's going through something. You could, of course, reach out to your pastor, or you could also go to a professional Christian counselor. And as Andy pointed out, a good source for a good resource to find one is the American Association of Christian Counselors. Their website is aacc.net, aacc.net. And a good, able Christian counselor will understand that God doesn't waste your pain. We need to allow God to be our Heavenly Father and shape us into the men and women He wants us to become. That way, on the other side of our pain, we can be a blessing to others that are going through the same thing. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to go to my website, davidsandstrom.com. On the website, I always post a transcript, a full transcript of the entire episode. You can read it there online, or you can download it and take it with you on your phone and read it later. And if you want, you can always leave me a comment there. If you leave me a comment, I will be sure to reply to you. If you know somebody that you think may enjoy this episode, share the episode with them. Tell them about the podcast. I would appreciate you spreading the word. As always, thank you for giving me some of your valuable time. I appreciate you spending some time with me this week and allowing me to serve you. I'll talk with you next week. Until then, be blessed. Thank you.